the River Ravi in the Punjab, December 1998. It's here that the lifeless body of a young mother from Coventry is said to have been thrown after being strangled. But the body is never found. Murder, the taking of human life, the most serious of all offences. Some cases are easy to solve, others extraordinarily complicated. But for the homicide detective, the challenge always remains the same. To find enough hard evidence to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that the suspect is guilty. In this series, I'm opening up the murder files to forensically examine how some of the darkest and most baffling cases were solved. I'm talking to leading detectives, delving into their minds, interrogating their strategies to find out step by step how they brought down some of the country's most evil and cunning perpetrators. December 4th, 1998. 27-year-old Sergeant Atwell travels from London to the Punjab to attend two family weddings. Sergeant never returns. The case is exceptionally difficult as the crime was committed abroad and her body was never recovered. A murder without a corpse is one of the most difficult challenges a detective can face. Today I'm meeting former Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll, the police officer who finally cracked the deeply disturbing Sergeant Atwell case. Clive Driscoll retired from the Met in 2014 after an illustrious career spanning more than three decades, including the solving of the murder of Stephen Lawrence. He was the head of the cold case unit at the Met when he took on this difficult case a particularly abhorrent slaughter of a young Sikh mother in the prime of her life. A crime that took place behind a curtain of impenetrable fear, where the price for breaking the code of silence could be death. It was six years after Sergeant's disappearance that the case finally dropped onto the desk of Detective Driscoll. Thanks mainly to the dogged persistence of her family, and in particular her brother Jagdish Singh. Initially investigated as a missing person, her family were convinced that Sergeant had in fact been murdered. There had been a previous investigation which, hadn't, which had actually not resulted in any success. And it, it really was Mr Jagdish Singh who was, uh, had been pushed to show that his sister, Sergeant Athwell, was, was in fact missing. And I picked it up at a stage where they were looking to see if there was any fresh evidence. Clive... Why did you decide to take on this particularly difficult case? There did appear to have been an injustice here, and indeed, and not all inquiries that could have been done had been done. As always, my main, main aim was to get some kind of justice for the family. They would obviously want their loved one to come back. I can't do that, but the next best thing I can do is get them justice. In this investigation, you faced the biggest hurdle any homicide detective could, because there was no body. No, it's because the only one I've personally done. I've obviously been in and around working on murders for many years, but this was the first one where there was no body, and, and it always sounds slightly cold when a police officer says it, but a body is a crime scene in its own way. A body can yield evidence to help you catch the bad guys. But on this occasion, we knew that that body was in India, so that we, we also had the other crime scene, the other crime scene around the murder scene, if you like, wasn't in England as well. So, yes, it, that was difficult in its own way. Uh, one, establishing that we could prove death beyond reasonable doubt, and secondly, that we could prove that the suspects were responsible for that murder. What were the particular problems in the early and first investigation? I think in the early and first investigation, they just didn't believe that Sergeant Athwell had been murdered because it remained a missing persons inquiry, which usually, that's a very strong steer, that they felt that Sergeant Athwell hadn't been murdered. If you're a missing person, you may get a very small team looking for you. If you're a murdered person, you get a very large team looking for you. So, so initially, that was the problem. Sergeant Atwell disappeared on a family visit to a wedding in the Punjab in 1998. 
Despite her brother and father insisting that her disappearance was out of character, police drew a blank, believing her husband's story that she'd run away with another man in India. The file on Sergeant Atwell's unsolved disappearance in 1998 is left to gather dust for six years until top cold case sleuth DCI Clive Driscoll takes it on. He begins an investigation which will take further years to solve. Clive, how did you start your investigation? You have to start virtually at the beginning. You have to um, make sure that you know exactly what happened. Taking yourself right the way back to find out what had happened and then finding out about Sergit's past, that whole family learning about them. Sergit was born in Coventry in 1971. In 1988, aged just 16, she had an arranged marriage with Suk Dave Atwell, a man she only meets for the first time on her wedding day. A quiet, conscientious teen, Sergit moves into her new husband's family home in West London. Here, her life is completely controlled by the strict rules of this Sikh family. Dominated by her widowed mother-in-law, formidable matriarch, Bakankur Atwell, who lives right next door. What dynamics were in play in the family that you discovered early on? Normally in a Sikh household, it's always the adult male, the oldest male, that becomes the head of the family. But in this family, Bakankur um, Atwell, who was the mother of the family, had assumed that role. Sergit lived with her husband, Sukhdev, a part-time coach driver in Hayes, Middlesex. Her mother-in-law, Bakankur, lived next door with her other son and his young wife. The two homes coexisted as one claustrophobically strict household. Because the mother-in-law was the centre of the universe, the Queen Bee, if you like, that the sons almost did exactly what they were told. So she was, she was totally in control of everything that happened in their lives. Under Bakankur's watchful eye, Sergit is beaten by her husband, Sukhdev, for any minor infraction or perceived breach of the family's code of honour. A year before her disappearance, Sergit can stand it no longer and runs away, swearing never to return. Furious Bakankur, Sergit's domineering mother-in-law, orders her son to track down his missing wife and threaten to kill her if she doesn't come back. Sergit is dragged back into the controlling clutches of the family, where she's then beaten for daring to defy them. But what was obvious from almost second day was that Bakankur Athwell ruled that family with a rod of iron. Sergit only has one ally in this stifling family her sister-in-law, Sarbjit, who lived next door. Both girls had married at almost the same time. Sarbjit pictured left on her wedding day and Sergit on the right. Both are shocked at the controlling atmosphere in their new homes. Both live in fear of their tyrannical mother-in-law, Bakankur Atwell. Their shared experience in this harsh environment is their only comfort. I have to say, it's hard to explain how unfree the, the two daughter-in-laws were, you know, in as much as that they didn't have lives of their own, and you could almost argue they were bordering on slaves. Bakankur's control over her daughters-in-law is so total that when, in 1991, Sergit gives birth, Bakankur snatches up her new granddaughter and insists on the child calling her mummy. It seemed every tool of manipulation and abuse uh, was used and it made life nearly impossible for Sergit and her sister-in-law in the house. It was incredibly sad. They, they used every tool they could to undermine the confidence of these two women. It, was a, it wasn't a very happy household for the, for the two women. Driscoll's meticulous investigation unearthed Sergit's heartbreaking diaries from the time. The notes that were in her diary were, were you know, made every, you know, even by the very, very hard-nosed detective sergeant, and even he had a, had a lump in his throat. The diaries detailed the domestic violence inflicted upon her by her husband, Sukhdev, 
and how all her money was controlled by him and her mother-in-law, Bakankur. Despite this nightmare family existence, Bakankur did allow Surjit to work as a customs officer at Heathrow Airport. This was probably because her wage supported the whole family and paid the mortgage. But unbeknownst to Bakankur, her husband Sukhdev, and the rest of the family, Surjit was living a double life. Paint a, a, a normal day for Surjit. When she'd leave the house, the home, the family home, she'd look reasonably traditional as a young Indian traditional woman. She'd then go off to Heathrow where she worked and she went into the, the toilet and then completely changed. She put makeup on, she changed the whole appearance. She was actually Miss Heathrow in 1994. So she, she actually put an entirely different face on. And when she went back, she reversed the process. Surjit wants the freedom her friends at work enjoy. Under the very noses of her controlling family, and in spite of the threat of violence, Surjit embarks on a love affair with a married colleague at work in Heathrow. She is planning a new life away from the clutches of her abusive mother-in-law. She now confronts her husband, Sukhdev, demanding a divorce. And what was, uh, do you think, uh, the implications for her asking for a divorce in terms of the family finances? Because um, she was the breadwinner, just the law as it stands today, she most certainly would have been entitled to a, a fairly large share of that house. There didn't appear to be any other people earning large sums of money. That would have had quite a catastrophic effect on the finances of that household. What was the family's response to this shocking news that a divorce was being demanded? Back and court always said that she didn't ever want anything outside the house that would ever bring shame on the family. And shame actually comes in many different guises because I think when, when Sergeant decided to try and live a life away from the family, there would have been the shame of a failed marriage. There would have been a shame that she enjoyed another person's company more than that family. There'd have been the shame of them losing their house. At her local temple, or Gudwa, Bakankur was well respected for her charity work and strict adherence to traditional Sikh family values. Everything Surjit was planning to do would have undermined Bakankur's standing in the Gudwa, where she used to go every day and cook, and it would have made the community, in her eyes, look at her in a, in a lesser fashion. Her honour had been offended, she would have been shamed, Despite the family objections, Surjit refuses to back down. She instructs solicitors, and days before her disappearance, Surjit contacts the lawyers again to tell them to await further instructions. I think she, she had a marriage that, that hadn't worked, and she believed that she'd found love with another man. So what happened was she wanted out of that family, and they, they weren't going to let that happen, no matter what. Still to come, a trip to India ends in the disappearance and murder of Surjit, but there's no corpse. Young mother Surjit Atwell disappeared in December 1998. It wasn't until nine years later that the cold case was taken over and ultimately solved by Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll. But finding out who committed this callous crime, let alone bringing them to justice, is no easy task. Clive, how did you go about rescuing this failed, flawed cold case? There is only one way, whenever you're looking at a historical case, and you have to read every single decision that's ever been made. So for me, it was just going over absolutely everything. And above all, looking at um, the interviews, because there had been previous interviews, and, and just trying to see where are we today with what we know. Clive, a young woman had disappeared. Where did you start looking for suspects? I started looking very closely at the family, and I started looking, at, if you like, the dynamics of that family, and then gradually piecing together the various parts each family member had played. Surjit, the missing woman, is the mother of two young children. Her mother-in-law, Bakankur, rules her life with a rod of iron and encourages her husband, Sukhdev Atwell, to beat her when she rebels. Surjit is having an affair with her work colleague in Heathrow, 
where she's a customs officer and shortly before her disappearance asks for a divorce. Inevitably, when a partner goes missing, they start looking very close to home. Well, she had a very uh, violent relationship. There, there was evidence that domestic violence had been reported to the police. Um, certainly a witness who knew of the relationship. It was a very unhappy marriage. Surjit's only ally in the Atwell household is her sister-in-law, Sarbjit, who was equally under the control of mother-in-law, Bakankur. But Surjit is still looking to escape on her own terms. This is a very unhappy family. She found love. What choices did she have? She did instruct solicitors. So, you know, she saw her future away from that family. The Atwell family are terrified that the revelations of Surjit's affair and the request for a divorce will bring shame on the Atwell name and lose them respect and standing in their community. It's now the start of December 1998. Surjit's mother-in-law, Bakankur, is due to attend a number of family weddings in India, and Surjit is cajoled into going with her. How was Surjit persuaded to leave the country and go to India? They made promises that, that, that she would be given the divorce that she craved for uh, if she went with Bachan to India and almost preserved the family honour while she was out there, two family weddings, and, and so she felt that when she come home, that she was going to be given the freedom she, she wanted. But Clive Driscoll uncovered evidence that Surjit wasn't safe in India and that someone had actually tried to warn the police at the time that there was a plot to kill her while she was there. And that warning was given by Surjit's only friend, her terrified sister-in-law, Sarbjit. In terms of the red flags, the warning signs that it might indeed have prevented a murder, what did you see? Sergeant Athwell, who had made a phone call to Crime Stoppers prior to um, basically Sergeant leaving. What did Sergeant Atwell tell Crime Stoppers in that phone call? She said that there'd been a family meeting that she'd been told to attend, and in that family meeting, back and core, had used an Indian expression, which the best translate to English is "get rid of Sergeant Athwell." And so, what she was trying to do was get the information into the police. Sarbjit calls Crime Stoppers on the day Surjit and Bakankur fly to India. But tragically, this information is not acted upon by the police at the time. Surjit's husband, Sukhdev, drives the pair to the airport. And on the 4th of December, 1998, doomed Surjit travels to India with her mother-in-law, Bakankur. Do we have any sense of her mood uh, as she went to the airport and commenced her final journey. I don't believe she could have had any idea that the woman that sat next to her on the plane for the length of time a flight to India takes, about 10 or 12 hours, was about, had plotted her murder. So she believed she would have been with like a, a joy, joyful heart that she was going to get the freedom that she wanted. Surjit lands in Delhi with her mother-in-law, where the pair are met by Bakankur's brother, who drives them to the family weddings in the rural Punjab. Surjit is now isolated in a country she barely knows and with a family who are secretly plotting to kill her. It's possible she realises and tries to escape as she visits a travel agent in Amritsar to try to bring forward her flight home. But she's unable to change the ticket. What do we actually know was true about her movements in India. She did definitely attended two um, weddings, family weddings in, in the Punjab area. And, and then, you know, the 14th of December, 1998, that's when it all stopped. After the 14th of December, uh, 1998, there are no records of anything to do with Sergei Athwell. Phone calls, bank, no sightings, no phone calls to friends. Literally, Sergei Athwell stopped being Sergei Athwell. Bakankur returns to London as planned on December 18th, 1998. Sergei does not. She is never seen or heard of again. When Bakan returned on the 18th of December without Sergei, how did she proceed to re-enter Sikh society and to kind of retrieve her standing in society? 
by actually completely destroying Sergei Athwell and laying the false trail that Sergei Athwell had deliberately left her in India and deliberately not come home with her and had met a man called Raj and disappeared off to a different part of India. As they attempt to re-establish the family's upright status in the Sikh community, Vakankur and Surjit's husband, Sukhdev, set about wiping away all trace of her existence. They just literally took this girl almost out of this world in as much as the day that she never come home, they moved every single photograph, they moved everything to do with Surjit Athwell out of the house and put it in a loft. Sukhdev Athwell actually phoned in and tried to terminate her employment, saying that she decided she was staying in India and she wasn't coming home. Did anyone in her workplace get concerned about her disappearance, including her old partner? For me, that's one of the real disappointments, that nobody who you would have hoped, other than Mrs. Sarbjit Athwell, no one was looking for Sergey Athwell. But one person who cared about Sergey and the future of her two young children is her sister-in-law, Sarbjit. After hearing the mother-in-law back on Kaur's threat that Surjit would disappear in India, Sarbjit summons up the courage to ask back on Kaur where Surjit really is. Bachin, in a fairly cold way, explained that she'd been murdered and that she'd been strangled and that, um, you know, that she's not coming home and it's been done now. We can forget about Surjit. She no longer exists. She's no longer in our hair. And that's when everything was removed from the house and it's almost like she was brushed straight from history. Sarbjit, Sergit's sister-in-law, now has the terrifying information that her friend has been strangled and is dead. And that her mother-in-law, whom she shares a house with, is one of the killers. I think there is a mixture of absolute terror and absolute wish to save Sergit Athwell. She wanted to do her best for Sergit, but by the same token, she was almost trying to escape. You know, there was a terror there as well. But Sarbjit found the strength to try to alert the authorities the only way she knew how, which Clive discovered as he reopened the files. She wrote that letter saying what she knew. Now, I, I, she didn't put her name to that, and I can understand totally why she didn't put her name to that, because, you know, that was the fear factor. But despite Sarbjit's sudden disappearance and this anonymous letter telling the police that Sarbjit was dead and that her family are responsible, nothing is done. Sergit's mother-in-law, Bakankur, and her husband, Sukhdev, present themselves to the public as the opposite of a scheming, murderous double act. If someone from the community described Bakankur Athwell, they'd probably describe her as a very dedicated grandmother, very dedicated to the Sikh faith. Um, Sukhdev Athwell, yeah, they probably describe him as a very, very uh, good member of the community, goes to the good work quite regular. But as Clive Driscoll reads the files on Surgit's disappearance, he forms his own opinion. If I described back and call Athwell, I'd say she's the coldest murderer I've ever dealt with. This was, no doubt in my mind, a, a, a well-planned murder. Clive Driscoll now has strong reason to suspect the Atwell family. And although many years have passed since Surgit's disappearance, he is determined to get justice. There was more than enough evidence to show that Sergit certainly weren't missing. She'd probably been murdered. And, and the task that my team undertook was now to prove that. As he digs deeper into the records, he finds more and more suspicious behaviour from the Atwell family. First, from Sergit's husband, Sukhdev, only days after her disappearance. Sukhdev went to the police station to try and convince them to even stop the missing persons inquiry. When he failed on the 21st of December, 1998, he went back on the 23rd of December and tried again to convince the police not even to be looking for her as a missing person. So there was evidence that this was a family that had, you know, were trying their hardest to prevent an investigation, which you would have thought if they were genuine and they generally had thought that they'd lost a family, they'd want the police to look for them. So, there was evidence to show that they were scheming from a very early stage. 
What other evidence did you find that uh, something uh, uh, untoward was taking place? Well, her husband, Sukhdev Athwal, had taken out insurance policies in her name, uh, which would have had, you know, had, had they paid out, would have been a considerable amount of money. In relation to the life insurance policy on Surjit's uh, life taken out by her husband, uh, Sukhdev, can you explain uh, how he hoped to get paid out if she disappeared? He would have had to been saying she's dead because that's how you get paid out. Whilst he was telling the police, well, no, actually, she's run off to Mumbai. So I think that part of their plot actually didn't go particularly well for them. Driscoll is building up a clearer picture of the possible suspects in Sergeant Atwell's murder. Her husband, Suk Dave, and mother-in-law, back in core. But nobody believed this respectable Sikh family could be capable of such evil. I actually think that the family, the murder, the two murder suspects, almost come across more credible than the people that were trying to report the crime to police. This family that were well respected in their goodwa, they were well respected locally, people spoke well of them, and yet we, they, they almost undermined the character of Surgit to the point that we veered towards them as people. It's almost as if the police, f for trying not to offend someone, trying not to offend someone's honour, almost shifted into the suspect's camp. How difficult was it to get the confidence of the community? Because there appeared to be a bit of a wall of silence that officers were confronted with. We went out to the wider community showing what we'd done with the key witnesses, that we weren't pushing the key witnesses away. We were listening to the key witnesses and we were gathering evidence around the key witnesses. Clive Driscoll's next discovery is that in 2000, back in Coor and her son, Suk Dave, had attempted to influence the investigation in India as well by brazenly using letters sent to them by the British police. What extreme lengths did the family go to to try and cool off the police's interest in this missing persons case? In a very early part of the investigation, the police wrote to um, Bakken and Sukhdev Athwell, inviting them into the police station. So they actually had an official police letter. Top right-hand corner, Metropolitan Police logo, bottom, a signature of a detective inspector. And using a fairly crude system, of photocopying, so putting a blank square of paper, photocopying it, so you've still got the police logo and the signature. They then put their own middle bit, directing the Indian authorities to, to stop their investigation. Each piece of evidence is damning for Bakankur and Sukhdev. But Driscoll discovers more fraud, a bogus divorce between Sukhdev and Surjit that gives him full control of the family home. Surjit's husband, Suk Dave, got remarried after a divorce. How could he get divorced without uh, the presence of his ex-wife, the missing Surjit? They forged the signature of, of Surjit. Someone somewhere just saw an address that they needed to send documents to. Nobody ever really asked a question who dealt with the documents at the other end. In her absence, in her death, she was ostensibly signing divorce papers and signing the transfers of deeds uh, over of a house. So she was pretty active in her death, wasn't she? Did anyone ask the question, how did he get divorced? How were the deeds transferred? No, because they all sit in isolation, don't they? The systems all sit in isolation. So the divorce is, is dealt with by that part of the system. But no one's asking about the missing person from that part of the system. The system can be quite frail. Every document from, you know, when contested a divorce, got sent to the same address that Suk Dave Athwell was living in. So he was able to, if you like, control that situation. It was quite an eye-opener how, how easy it was to undermine our systems. By investigating the divorce papers and the title deeds to the house, DCI Driscoll now has concrete proof of forged signatures showing wrongdoing by the Atwell family. It's the evidence that could turn this missing person's case into a murder investigation. 
in 2004, Batchen and Sukhdev forged Surjit's signature to remove her name from the title deeds of her home. At last, incriminating physical evidence of criminality. Finally, the net is closing in. Years have passed since young mother Surjit Atwell disappeared on a trip to India in 1998. Her husband and mother-in-law claim she'd run away. But Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll has uncovered evidence that the pair stole some of Surjit's property and is convinced that both are involved in her murder. Now he needs to prove it. In 2005, when DCI Driscoll first reopened the file on Surjit's disappearance, he found an anonymous letter claiming that Surjit had been killed in India on the orders of her mother-in-law, Bakankur, and husband, Sukhdev. But at the time, Driscoll had no idea who'd written the letter until a medical emergency forced their hand and they came forward to the police. It was Surjit's sister-in-law, Sarbjit Atwell. What finally prompted Sarbjit Atwell to come to the police again? I actually think the worry, the stress and the strain really played badly on her. And so she actually had a, a burst ulcer. She came very close to dying. She lost a considerable amount of blood. And, and I think she felt that she was going to die. And she didn't want the information she had to die with her. So she told her father, uh, Mr Bath, and she told her mum exactly what had happened to Sergi Athwell, that she wasn't like the, the, the community had been told, run off with another bloke. She was, in fact, dead. Sarjit's parents are horrified to hear the truth of Sarjit's cruel murder in India at the hands of her family. They persuade Sarjit to tell Driscoll the whole story. What did uh, Sarjit Atwell tell you in interview? But she, she, she said that prior to the 4th of December, when Sergeant Athwell flew off, that there'd been a meeting in, in the house called by Batchen. And in fact, they, you know, Batchen Corps had, had said that she'd got the permission of Sukhdev and that they were going to deal with Sergeant in India. It had been taken care of. And what Mrs Athwell said is that she clicked her fingers like that and used an expression in Indian, Punjabi, which technically the best, if you like, the best way we can translate it is I'm going to get rid of her. And that was really the start, you could argue, of my investigation. What Sarbjit tells Driscoll matches the warning letter she'd given Crime Stoppers before Surjit's death. And the anonymous letter she'd sent to police after Bakankur admitted having Surjit murdered. What did that letter mean as a piece of evidence? Well, it shows that back in 1998 that Mrs Athwell was trying her hardest to tell us what was going on. So she hasn't made it up in 2004. She hasn't made it up in 2005. She hasn't suddenly fallen out with her, her in-laws, so I'm going to get you. This, it's a continuity. It's a continuity of what's being said by that person. But Sarbjit still lives within the Atwell household under the watchful gaze of murderous mother-in-law, Bakankur. Driscoll has his work cut out persuading Sarbjit to testify against her in-laws. She was petrified that that would seep out. Why did she particularly distrust the police and also distrust you when you started to reinvestigate it? I think the thing that really she finds the most hard to take is having, having written a letter explaining what had happened after she'd met back and call after and in a very cold... A concise way, back and Cora told her that Sergit had been murdered. That the police suggested to her that she never wrote the letter. She she had no confidence in the police whatsoever. She felt that we'd let her down. She wasn't too sure whose side we was on. If if you know that's that's what I the, inf the, the that's what I got from it. it was she wasn't too sure whose side we were batting on. But meeting face to face with Sarbjit, Driscoll persuades her. This time, the police are here to help. When you told her you'd found the letter and believed her, what was her reaction? She cried. But that was a very traumatised, quite threatened, quite petrified woman sitting in front of me. Driscoll now feels he has enough testimony from witnesses and damning paper evidence of Sergit's husband and mother-in-law's fraud to start a full-blown murder investigation. But without a corpse or a crime scene, Driscoll knows he needs more evidence to prove Sergit's murder. 
the previous investigations that had been to India had never brought anything back. We wanted to go and see what the Indian police had done and we wanted to see if we could get some more information. There was a short period of time I was called the South Asian Crime Squad. Driscoll applies for a visa to visit India and to find witnesses to surge its movements around the time of the weddings. It takes up to 10 months for the Indian authorities to grant permission for the British police to investigate the case. And the wedding guests have long since returned to their homes around the world. We travelled the world, really. It was uh, We went to Denmark, we went to Singapore, we went to Canada. We, we really, if, if there was a witness that we thought that could add to this case, um, then, then that's where we would go. Obviously, we went to India. And what access and what support did you get from the Indian authorities? The way the Indian police investigate and the way the police investigate here are so different. One particular police officer who was in charge of Pathankot um, police station, which was the, effectively the police station that covered the area, was he was extremely helpful. But I can only describe the difference in the system by there was another person that we interviewed under as a suspect, effectively. Um, and when we finished the interview, the Indian police invited us to sit down for something to eat, and they brought the bloke we just interviewed out to sit with us. It is a different... It's a different sort of world. Driscoll is interested in speaking to anyone who met Sergis on her final trip. One is Darshan, Bakankur's brother, who picked Sergit up from the airport and drove her to the weddings in the Punjab. Clive makes some headway interviewing other people in the area where Sergit was last seen. There were witnesses in India, um, and I'd have to say that the, the witnesses were giving evidence that Sergit Athwell was at this address. Whether the whole village knew, I don't know, but uh, there was enough people who said, yes, she was here, and yes, we don't know what happened to her, when she just disappeared. Clive also hears reports that Sergit's jewellery was sold locally around the time of her disappearance. But many people Clive meets are unwilling to be witnesses for the British investigation. Despite the frustrations, Driscoll's painstaking work is forming a solid case against Sergit's mother-in-law, back in core. I have to say that it was really um, just going through what they'd said and slowly but surely... Just put in little, that, that can't be true. Now, that can't be true. You know, what, what back Batchen said, that can't be true. So that we can prove to the court there'd been this planned murder of Sergei Athman. But as Driscoll's work in India hits the news, back in England, Sergei's husband, Sukhdev, and mother-in-law, Bakankur, become suspicious that someone has spoken to the police. Their distrust focuses on the perceived weak link in their family, Bakankur's surviving daughter-in-law, Sarbjit. She was threatened. She was threatened many, many times. Sukhdev drove his car at her. You know, uh, Sukhdev used to speak to her husband a lot and tell her, are you keeping her in check? If ever it, it looked like the police like, might re you know, get reignited in interest in this case, then threats followed. Their threats begin to work against Sarbjit and Driscoll's case starts to fall apart. Sarbjit is in real danger. She's been given a clear warning that her life is at risk if she talks. At this stage, the threats succeed. She refuses to make a formal statement to the police. But Driscoll's case doesn't stand up unless she testifies. Will she have the courage? Former Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll was brought in to re-examine the cold case disappearance and suspected murder of Sergeant Atwell in 1998. After reviewing the case files, he wins over the trust and confidence of a fearful prime witness. Sergeant Atwell was Sergeant's sister-in-law, who knew that Sergeant's former husband, Sukhdev, and her mother-in-law, Bakankur, had lured Sergit to India and then had her killed. But as Driscoll's case gathers steam, so does the killer pair's suspicion that Sarbjit has been speaking to the police. The family closes ranks and turns on Sarbjit. As a vital witness in the prosecution case, Sarbjit's life is in mortal danger from her own family. 
Without Sarbjit's testimony in court, Driscoll's case will fall apart. And then mother-in-law back in court makes a chilling suggestion to Sarbjit that she goes on a family trip to India. It follows the pattern so closely of Sarbjit's murder that Driscoll comes up with a drastic plan to save his star witness. So in order to protect her, you arrested her along with the two key murder suspects. Yeah. But uh, what happened in the police station? We took Mrs Athwell, put her by the, the front counter and stood, you know, basically another member of the family next to her who spoke to her in Punjabi. She did have a threat to kill standing in a British police station surrounded by British police officers. I would love to think that in any police station, if you were surrounded by British police officers, you'd be safe as houses. If you're surrounded by white English police officers who don't speak Punjabi and someone makes a threat to you in Punjabi, they don't know, do they? The family's attitude at the police station and Sarbjit's sustained insistence it is Bakan and Sukhdev who planned the murder of Surjit in India mean Driscoll is sure he's got the right people in custody. It was fairly obvious that this was a girl that had been murdered... Well, this was a girl that had been tricked to go abroad and there'd been a plan to take her life from day one. Nearly nine years have passed since Surjit was killed in India and her body thrown in a river with no hope of recovery. Driscoll has no forensic evidence to link mother-in-law Bakankur and husband Sukhdev to the murder. Without such direct evidence, he is relying on Sarbjit as his key witness to actually testify in court. Driscoll even goes to the lengths of making sure Sarbjit lives away from the Atwell family under police protection. What was it like on the eve of trial with a witness who was still living in fear of her life? The court rely on evidence. If a witness is, is intimidated that they don't give evidence, that's not justice. So I, I was determined that, that Sergeant Athwell and other witnesses, there were other witnesses, I was determined that they were able to tell their story to the court. Despite Sarbjit being terrified of her in-laws, she bravely testifies against the family which had controlled and bullied her. But despite the weight of evidence against them, in court, Bakankur and Sukhdev show little fear of conviction. What was the demeanour of the two suspects, the murder suspects, in the dock? They were um, disrespectful. They were, in my opinion, they showed no great um, remorse at all. And they were... They were chatting in their own language, uh, which the judge told them off for once. How did you think the jury were reacting to the evidence, particularly the evidence of uh, Sarbjit Atwell? I think they were quite shocked by some of the detail that, you know, of, of what happened to Sarbjit. And they were very, very, very concentrated, but also, I think, shocked by what they heard. And even on the last day of the trial, Bakankur is confident of being acquitted. Bakken had actually said goodbye to the prison officers. You know, so as if to say, you've been very good to me, I've enjoyed your company, but I'm going home now. But the jury found them guilty. Mother-in-law Bakankur and husband Sukhdev were sentenced to life imprisonment. At the end of the 13-week trial, Judge Giles Forrester told the pair they had betrayed Sergit. He said, how you could commit this unspeakable act I do not know. There was no motive worthy of the name. You decided the so-called honour of your family was more important than the life of this young woman. This was a heinous crime characterised by great wickedness. I immediately phoned Mrs. Sarbjit Athwell, uh, who was out shopping, and, and I actually said, look, I just want to inform you that they're guilty verdicts. And I know, I didn't know because the phone went dead, but she collapsed. Driscoll had succeeded in building his murder case in a different country to where the crime was committed against two people who didn't themselves do it and without even a corpse as evidence. Something unprecedented in British legal history. He returned to court to watch Bakankur and Sukhdev receive their punishment. What was the demeanour of Sukhdev and Bachchan Atwell in court when they received those very harsh sentences? I have been told that they, that they almost immediately were going to appeal, so they, they thought, they, they generally believed 
that this was, you know, it was all going to be all right, you know, it would be all right in the night in the future. Their appeal fails, but their minimum terms are reset to 15 years for Bakancourt Atwell and to at least 20 years behind bars for Sergeant's husband, Suk Dave Atwell, for the heartless murder of his young wife. In many ways, your investigation restored some trust in the police, some much needed trust. Uh, what, what do you think is the overall impact of the conviction for the two murder suspects? My strategy was I didn't want them to win anything. So they'd managed to get the two children of the family, but I, that can't be right, that you've, you're putting two children with a family that arranged a murder, their mum. So I went to Reading Children's Court and we eventually got the children away. They'd managed to sell a house, which should have been for the children. We got all the money back and gave it to the, to the children, you know. So we, we actually, I can look you in the eyes and say that that murder did not benefit the bad guys at all. And to Sarbjit Atwell, who, lived through the murder plot and ultimate murder and terror of living with the murderers for years and years. What did this mean to her? To her, her charity, True Honour, now tries to help people. And to Mrs. Sarbjit Aswell's credit, I think her bravery of standing up to, to you know, real intimidation has saved lives. She won't know that, and we, know, we won't know who those lives are but she has saved lives. This was a near impossible crime to solve. A murder without a body and a family determined to hold on to its dark secrets. Without Clive's dogged determination and the bravery of key witnesses, this case would never have got to court.